The battle between the FBI and Apple over unlocking the San Bernardino killer's iPhone may be over, but the fight over encryption has just been dramatically ramped up. The online messaging service WhatsApp, which has over a billion users, just added end-to-end -end encryption on all of its services, including messages, phone calls, photos, and videos. Wired Magazine got an exclusive interview with WhatsApp co-founders Jan Coombe and Brian Acton and Wired editors at large. Jason Tanz is here to tell us more. Jason, good morning. Good morning. These guys don't talk very often. So this is a big deal to actually have them talking about what they view as the future. First off, what is end-to-end -end encryption? How do you explain it to people? So if I'm sending you a message with end-to-end -end encryption, basically the only uh, way you can decipher that message is if you have your specific phone. So nobody can tap into it while it's being sent. And m most importantly, the company that's hosting this app has no record of it either. Okay, now Apple has end-to-end -end encryption as well, but so how, if at all, does this differ? So the difference is that WhatsApp is huge. We don't use it as much in the US, so it may not be as familiar to people, but it has a billion users. Uh, Apple's iMessage, you know, you can only send that between Apple users, and uh, they're, they're nowhere, there's nowhere close to a billion. Uh, there's also Apple the issue of, of the cloud with Apple as well, right? Yeah, that's right. A, a lot of uh, iMessages can be backed up in iCloud if you use that service. Um, so that immediately ameliorates any, any benefit that you would get from end-to-end -end encryption. I think a lot of people, especially after Brussels, became increasingly nervous about how these interactions are happening and if the government is not able to tap into them. How do they defend what they're doing right now, that it should all be encrypted and there's no, foot, there's no footprint? What they would say is, uh, you know, law enforcement has been able to fight crime for millennia without uh, having access to everybody's conversation in real time. Mm -hmm. And so basically this is just an excuse uh, or a, a, that they should be focusing more on their intelligence work and less on inserting back doors into everybody's communications. Can WhatsApp actually guarantee this end-to-end -end encryption and in in your security? Uh, well, there's no way to absolutely guarantee anything. Right? Yeah. But what they can do is they can guarantee that if the government comes to them with a warrant and says, we need records of these people's conversation, they can say, we don't have it. Yeah. You know, it's, it's as encrypted to us as to anybody else. It's just not there. Yeah, we can't get it. But you know, when you describe it, it seems like this would be an app that'd be very successful in the United States. So why is it that it's really only taken off overseas? Um, you know, some of this is just because messaging apps, uh, this messaging app in particular took, took off because it offered a free alternative to really expensive messaging services. Uh, and, and honestly, uh, texting is not so expensive in the U.S. that that was such a huge demand. So that's why it really grew internationally more than it did in the U.S. Kuhn, one of the, the co-founders of WhatsApp, grew up in the Soviet Union during communism. What effect, if any, do you think that's had on, on, on this move? Well, he has said that uh, he knows what it's like to not be able to trust that your communication with your family or friends is going to be private. Right. So that's certainly a motivation for him. That being said, you know, Brian Acton, the co-founder, was the one who was really pushing this uh, even more than Coombe. So they were both on board, of course, but right. it's not that this was some huge mission only from, from Coombe. It'll be interesting to see if this is, in fact, the future. Jason Tans, thank you so much. Thanks for having me.